Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Spirit of Prophecy podcast. I've been wanting to get to this episode for quite a while and I'm finally getting around to it. And what we are going to do today, we're going to do something I think is very important and I've kind of been building up to this as I have discussed a lot about the importance of language, understanding the language of the people that you are talking to. Uh, I talk a lot about terminology. I have a series on back to Bible terminology, and I have been making the argument that um, it is so important that we use Bible terms when discussing biblical things. It does not mean that it is not possible to use an extra biblical term and to use it accurately, but I submit to you that people who are wrong on doctrine are dependent on the use of extra biblical terms. And if you are not capable of articulating your position with biblical terms, it's probably because you are wrong. And in it, when it comes to dispensationalists, when it comes to pre-trivers, they must use extra biblical language because it, if they use biblical language, it will expose the fallacies of their teaching and the many contradictions it will show they are not using the words of God the way God used them. And so what they do, they use extra biblical terms and then they can define them for you and they can you know pretend they're using scripture to define these terms, but we're going to see that they are not, not at all. And so I've been trying to figure out the best way to uh, display what I want to teach and to just really um, help you visualize this and just uh, illustrate this in a way that is crystal clear. Uh, also, too, uh, I wanted I I was trying to figure out okay whose um, teaching do I use, even though all the pre-tribbers do the same thing. But again, independent fundamental Baptists who I'm trying to reach. They get very nervous when you talk about one of their guys. They get they get very sensitive, okay? Uh, bless their hearts, but pre-tribulational, dispensational Baptists are the most sensitive, delicate creatures on the planet when it comes to eschatology. They won't come in this program because they can't handle scrutiny. And, and they get really bent out of shape if you start talking about individuals, no matter how fair you are. And it's, it's kind of frustrating. So what I did... Even though all y'all do this and I've got proof, I've got books, I can name some of your fav fam favorite preachers and show how they do the same thing, but I'm going to be nice today and I'm going to use Tim LaHaye and Thomas Ice and their book, Charting the End Times. And I'm going to show you a couple things that they have in their book that um, all, all the pre-trivers do this, but what they have in this book is... Uh, a chart, I guess, showing rapture, the differences between the rapture and the way uh, Tim LaHaye puts it in the glorious appearing. So they believe that the, in fact, let me show this better, 15 differences between the rapture and the glorious appearing. Tim LaHaye does not believe that the rapture or the blessed hope, I should say, and the glorious appearing are the same thing. That is ridiculous. And I will illustrate that as we go through this, but according to him, the rapture and the glorious appearing are two different events. And so he has on there, uh, that at the rapture, Christ comes in the air for his own glorious appearing. Christ comes with his own to the earth rapture, rapture of all Christians and the glorious appearing. No one is raptured. Hey, okay, now I'm not going to go through all those right now. I think we'll do it at the end after we establish some biblical language. But here's another thing too. All Everybody does this in their prophecy books. They've got their rapture passages up here. And then they have their second coming passages right here. So you got to know the difference between the rapture of the church or the rapture of the saints, whatever you want to call it, and the second coming. So um, now, while there could be some variation amongst pre-tribbers in what they would put in the rapture uh, as a rapture passage or a second coming passage. There might be some variation there. Overall, it's mostly going to be the same. Most important one being 
all pre-tribbers would put the Matthew 24 passages as second coming or glorious appearing passages, not as rapture passages. That's what they would do. They will tell you that. And they'll make these nice fancy books or their nice fancy charts to just kind of cement these things in, our, in your mind. Here's what they will not do. They will not use the words of God to form these things in your mind. They can't do that. And I'm going to show you why that is. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to take some time to go read their rapture passages. Okay. Obviously, pre-tribbers and post-tribbers, there are passages we would re read and say, that is the rapture. They would say, no, it's not. That's the second coming or the glorious appearing or Armageddon, right? So here, let, here's what we're going to do. We are going to go to passages that we both would agree that are, they are about the rapture, okay? Where there's no argument. Yes, this is what we're waiting for. This is what we're looking for. But now here's what we are going to do. We are going to take the, their passages about the rapture and we are going to see if we can't establish a language, a terminology based on the words that God inspired these men to write and that were interpreted into our King James version of the scriptures. And then we're going to go look at some other passages where there is disagreement. And let's see if the terminology that we come up with from reading passages everyone agrees is about the rapture. Let's see if that terminology goes along with the passages that we would say are about the rapture, they would not. I think you're gonna find this very interesting and very helpful. So let's start out with the first one that they have on their list. We have John chapter 14, and uh, we'll start reading in verse one. Let me get these up on the screen for you so you can follow along. But notice what it says. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. So uh, obviously we don't have much for timing from that passage alone. But at the same time. I think it is safe for us if I were to get up and say, you know what, Jesus, while he did leave his disciples, he promised that he was going to someday come again and he was going to receive them to himself. And I would agree with Tim LaHaye, that is going to happen at the rapture. So now let's look at the second passage they have. They have Romans 8, 19. And it says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of of the sons of God. And I agree wholeheartedly that that is in fact something that is pointing to the, for lack of a better term, I, I need to start using Bible terms. Okay. I'm not going to say, I don't want to say the word rapture anymore. Okay. But let me just say, I believe John 14 and Romans A are referring to the same event. We are we are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, what does that mean? Okay, it's it might not be the clearest just from that verse, but I'm going to skip. Um, I'm going to go to another passage that they have in the category of rapture passages that I wholeheartedly agree is about the same event. And they have First John chapter two. And we'll let's look at what it says here, because I think this is definitely related to Romans chapter eight. Notice what it says. And now little children abide in him that when he, he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If we know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So notice we both agree. This is the same event, same as uh, John 14, Romans eight. And John called it. He said, when he shall appear. And before him at his coming. So I think it would be appropriate to use the terms appearing and coming to describe the event of John 14 and Romans chapter 8. I think that is appropriate. Now look at what it says in 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, 
we should be like him for we shall see him as he is. So when he appears, it will be man the, son the manifestation of the sons of God will take place. I am a son of God right now, but I, I look like a son of Adam. You know, I, that's what I look like. I physically don't look any different than a lost man, but there is something that is inside of me. There is something that is coming for me because I am a son of God right now, but it just doesn't appear yet. But at his appearing, that will be manifest. So without a doubt, these passages are all referring to the same event and they are referred to as when Christ shall appear and at his coming. Okay. So we have Christ in John 14 talking about how he's going to be leaving and then he's going to come and receive him to himself. That event is referred to as a coming. Shouldn't we be able to call that the second coming? Should we? Okay, but yes. And you know what? These guys have that covered because here's what they'll show you too. Let me show you this right here, right next to this uh, page showing the different passages, the two phases of his one coming. Okay. So we got the two phases of his one coming. So they got that covered, right? Just the fact that it's coming still doesn't mean it's the same event, okay? All right, but again, the two phases of his coming, okay? Can you show me where that is spelled out in the scriptures? Or is that just a necessary thing based on the assumption that your theology is correct? All What I'm doing, I'm looking strictly at the language that's used in these passages. Okay. And we're going, boy, are we going somewhere with this? So let's go ahead and look at some more passages. Let's go to first Corinthians chapter one and let's see what it says. I haven't even looked all, I didn't even look all these up ahead of time, but it says so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I agree that is the same event and it's called the coming of the Lord or the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, oh, I lost the spot. Yeah, and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, could the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord Jesus Christ be the same thing? Are those two different events? Boy, if you're a preacher, you better hope those are two different events because the Bible says the sun should be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Okay, we're just getting Bible terminology here. So we've got day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got the coming of the Lord. And yes, boy, we all agree these are the same event. We all We know from this event that the manifestation of the sons of God is going to take place. What we are on the inside is going to show on the outside. And that brings us to the next passage they have on the list that everyone agrees is the same event. And that is 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Would we all agree that that is the manifestation of the sons of God? That happens when he appears. When he appears, he's going to change us. That change will happen in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. This does not teach. There's nowhere in the scriptures that teaches the entire event of the coming of the Lord happens in a moment of twinkling of an eye. It teaches the changed body will happen in a moment of twinkling of an eye. As soon as we see him, I believe based on these scriptures, we will immediately be glorified and we will be like him. And that's going to happen. It's coming because we are going to, it looks like this event that we're supposed to be looking for, according to the scriptures, is one that we will see. We will see Christ coming we will see it's someone's appearing, okay? His appearing, that's a term that's been being used. If someone appears, don't you expect to see them? But it is, isn't it according to the thief of the night theology, we're just gonna be walking along one day and we're gonna disappear. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. We are going to change when he appears. That tells me when he shows himself, 
That is, this is something that's going to be visible. So let's go ahead and go to the next passage they have. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Okay, well, I don't really know what that helps or what that proves, but hey, uh, it's another scripture, it looks like. So um, Philippians, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. It's the next one they have, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. For sure, for sure, this seems like a theme, that changed body, that glorification of the saints, us losing this vileness, this corruption, putting on the immortality. That seems to be a really big part about the coming of the Lord. I, I'm, boy, we are, so far, we are 100% in agreement. These are all, as they would say, rapture passages. Now let's go to Philippians chapter four. In verse five, it says, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And I guess that just, they're just showing that he could come uh, at any time. I don't know really what that proves or accomplishes there, but Colossians three, four, this is a good one. This is the next one. They have Colossians three, four it says when Christ, who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Folks, how in the world do they have a chart on here that shows the differences between the rapture and the glorious appearing? They got rapture and blessed hope on the left and glorious appearing on the right. In their own scriptures that they're using, it keeps calling it his appearing. It says when he appears. How is when Christ appears, not his glorious appearing? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. How is that not the glorious appearing? It, but that's what they have on their charts because they've got to separate these things. And we're going we're to see why. We're going to see why, but we're, we're just establishing language from the scriptures that we all agree are about the same event. First Thessalonians chapter one. Let's go ahead and go to first Thessalonians chapter one and verse 10. And it says here, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And I agree, we are waiting for Jesus and he's gonna deliver us from the wrath to come. And I believe that takes place at his appearing. He will snatch us out of here before he pours out his wrath on the world. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, it says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. I agree. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting for that for sure. The same event. And then the next one they have is the main passage about the coming of the Lord, or as they would want to insist on saying the rapture. And we all know this passage frontward and backward. Let's point out a few things. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, with him. Uh, that looks like when Christ comes, he's going to have some people with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So I think it's safe to say from this passage that it's okay that to talk about this event as the coming of the Lord. It's okay to say that he's coming with his saints because we see very clearly that um, those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The context of the passage is he doesn't want them being ignorant about those who were asleep or who had already died on this earth. What's he saying? Jesus is going to come again 
and a reuniting is going to take place. And I think it's safe to assume that event would be the resurrection, which is what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. It says we shall not all sleep like those who had fallen asleep in Jesus, but we shall all be changed. That's going to be at the resurrection. So I think my language is very clear. The coming of our Lord takes place at the resurrection, at his appearing. We are going to see him. We are going to be like him at his coming. Uh, and, I, and I agree. Every one of these passages are, in fact, talking about the same event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's go ahead and look at 1 Thessalonians 5. And verse, it's got verse 9, I believe. it. Uh, was, yeah, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I agree. Now, obviously, with the pre-tribbers, we disagree on what's wrath and what's not. But the obtaining salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, that is, in fact, refer, uh, referring to a physical salvation that will take place at his coming. Okay? A, a physical salvation. Okay? So, based on a passage that these guys, pre-tribbers, used, and keep this in mind to prove or to, um, that it is about the same event that they would say is the rapture, that it's referring to physical salvation. We all agree. We're all saved right now. But when Christ returns, he's going to physically save us. Okay. There's going to be a physical salvation. So we're getting that from a passage that we would all agree is in fact about the rapture. Okay. Keep that in mind. Now, a physical salvation is coming that day. We and and because we will be it, those of us who are alive and remain, we will not face physical death. We will be spared that. So that is in fact physical salvation that takes place on that day. And so we're seeing that uh, here. Also, it says in verse twenty three, they have and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So without a doubt, if we're trying to keep our whole body, soul, and spirit blameless until that time, again, this is this is an event that we are waiting for, looking for. This is not something that's going to happen at the end of the seven years after the judgment seat of Christ and all that stuff. I'm fully in agreement with all their uses of these here. Now, let's go to another one that they have uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2.1. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So they agree that the coming of our Lord and our gathering together is in fact the same event as all these other passages we've been reading. The coming of our Lord, the appearing, the a gathering. These are all very interesting words. Some of you know where I'm going because you are familiar with these words. This is interesting language. Boy, what if we just use the language of Paul and John? All the people that he's referring to so far, we've seen John and Paul. Uh, we're looking at all their terminology. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6.14. 1 Timothy 6.14 and notice what it says. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that word appearing again. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. There's that word appearing again. I'm with these guys. This is, in fact, the same event. Verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Why don't we ever call the rapture the appearing? Paul really liked that word. Paul seemed to use that word an awful lot. Um, let's go to Titus 2.13. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, folks, this right here blows my mind that after all they have shared with us, 
folks, this is their, I'm going through their list. This is their list that I'm going through. Showing all these passages that they're saying are about the rapture over and over again. It has used the word appearing over and over again, uh, over and over again. We have seen the emphasis about the manifestation of the sons of God referring to the changed body, the glorified body that's going to take place. We don't have, we're not going to go through all of Titus 2. Titus chapter 2 is all about just our behavior, godly living, because the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. To them, the blessed hope is the rapture. And the blessed hope takes place at that event, but the blessed hope is God changing our vile body into one like his glorious body that's what it's all about that, that, that's what it's all about and that that our blessed hope the blessed hope is not an event event so much it's using that term blessed hope because that hope of a new changed glorified body that is like christ happens at his appearing do you all get that our blessed hope is that one day we will not deal with this flesh anymore when are we not going to have to deal with this flesh anymore at his appearing? So you're going to tell me the blessed hope and glorious appearing are two different events. After all these passages, they put before this one showing the change of our body, the glorified body showing over and again, it's just appearing, it's appearing, 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 appearing. And then it says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. And then to act like those are two separate events separated by seven years, they are the exact same event. They are forcing this into, and now not all pre-tribbers teach this, that the, about that verse, that the glorious appearing and that the blessed hope are two different events. Not all do. Many do. These guys for sure do. And that's a bunch of garbage and pre-tribbers ought to call that out. Folks, there is no question the glorious appearing and the blessed hope happen at the same time. There's no question about that. Hey, you cannot read all these passages and you tell me with the King James Bible in your hand, you can't tell me you believe that King James Bible and tell me those are two different events. Okay? You don't get your, your authority is not the scriptures. If you, if you say that your authority is theological textbooks is what it is. And so that, that's just the foolishness is off the charts. Literally when for them to make that claim and to act like those are two different events. But they've got, they've got Titus 2.13 in their section on the rapture, yet they have a whole section in this book showing the blessed hope and glorious appearing are two different events. It's all his coming, but there's two phases. There's two phases, okay? And they'll tell you, phase one, blessed hope, phase two, glorious appearing. No, the appearing is when we receive our blessed hope, the changed body, okay? See, for pre-tribbers, the blessed hope is just to get us out of this mess of a world so they don't have to pay their bills and deal with, you know, people that annoy them anymore. No. Back then, they cared about holiness. They cared about godliness. And they couldn't wait until the day when they didn't have to deal with the sin, not of others, but their own sin in their vile, rotten flesh. And so they did. They had a blessed hope that one day they would be like Christ. And they knew when that was going to happen at his appearing. They would see him and be like him. So just folks, everything I'm saying, I'm using biblical language across the board. This is, you know, so far, nobody can disagree with anything I'm saying. No honest pre-tribber can disagree with anything I'm saying. Hebrews 9, 28, and you can't say I haven't conclusively proved so far. We're going to get into some areas where you might think, well, it's, it's not that clear. I think it is, but uh, we should all be on the same page right now. We should all be on the same page. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So uh, there's that salvation again. And that word appearing in Hebrews. A lot of people think Paul wrote Hebrews. I don't know. Uh, it seems kind of like he did, but either way, we've got the same word talking about his appearing. Now let's take a look and see what James says. They've got James chapter five and verse seven. It says, be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, 
and hath long patience for it until you receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest he be condemned. Both the judge, uh, behold, the judge standeth before the door. So I agree. Clearly the same event. We're waiting for it. And it calls it the coming of the Lord. And, and notice there's been zero passages showing any indication of two phases. Without a doubt, we are talking about one and the same event. It's got 1 Peter 1, 7. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Well, what do you know? Peter called it the same thing. The appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Interesting. I, and I agree it's the same event at the revelation because this is something the believers are supposed to be waiting for of, and, and hoping for the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you. What is that grace? What is what what has been the theme throughout these passages that pre-trivers never want to talk about? We will be like Christ, the changed body. Everybody wants to just talk about avoiding tribulation. That is not what they talk about. They talk about the changed body. These people had a love for holiness and righteousness and godliness, and they were disgusted with the filth of their flesh. Our modern day American Christians, they don't give a rip. They don't care. Uh, so we got first Peter five, four says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And then we are, and then uh, the next one that was first John two. We already looked at that one. Now let's look at Jude. Boy, we got that word appear. Boy, that gets used an awful lot. That's so interesting. Jude verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I would agree that's alluding to the coming of the Lord. Uh, and then Revelation 2, 25 is the last one that they have. And it says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. So yeah, that's about the coming of the Lord. So we went through all the passages they had in their rapture section. Now, after having read all of that, would I be wrong in saying that this event that we are looking for and waiting for, we are, uh, if I refer to it as, you know, the blessed hope, the the manifestation of the sons of God, this there is a time that we are waiting for when God is going to change our vile body into one like his glorious body this event is going to take place at, at the coming of the lord we're waiting for the coming of the lord we are waiting for the resurrection of the dead we are waiting for the appearing of jesus christ we're looking for that day of the lord jesus christ so all these terms i'm using we find them over and over and over again in the scriptures that is the big event that is the big day and that's what we all want the coming of our lord the change of the body, you know, the, the resurrection of the dead. We're looking forward to every one of those things. And, and that's, it's going to happen at his coming at his coming. There is going to be a gathering that is going to take place. He's going to gather us together. We're going to, we're going to see him. We're waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we see him, we're going to be like him for we shall see him as he is. So all these things I'm saying, I'm using my own words, you know, I, I, my own choice of phrases and things, but the words that I'm using are the same words that are used in the scriptures by Paul, by Jesus, by Peter, by James, by Jude, all referring to these things. So we are, we're looking for that appearing and folks, again, I know this is just Tim LaHaye and, and, but I've heard other Baptists say this, the glorious appearing is the same event as the blessed hope. Okay. I, I, I dare you to challenge me on that. It is the glorious appearing is the rapture. It is the rapture. Don't even, don't even try to argue with me on that. The glorious appearing is a rapture. I will rub your nose in that. You go read all those passages and tell me that the glorious appearing is different than the blessed hope, that those are different events. You absolutely cannot do that. That is just eisegesis off the charts. Okay, now, 
here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to their second coming passages. Okay, so they've got their second coming passages that you can see on here. And, uh, you know, and notice it there towards the end, you've got Revelation 19. That, you know, I tend to believe is a different event, but I'm not, a, you know what? I'm not 100% sure. I might be wrong. I've been meaning to invite somebody on the program who uh, some I was told has a different opinion on that. And I'm, I'd be interested in hearing what he has to say about it because there are some things I can't answer when it comes to that. But again, I'm, I want to form my thinking on the words of God, not whatever textbook I like the best. No, the words of God. So let's go ahead now and start looking at the second coming passages as they put it. And so... It's interesting that the coming of the Lord is not the second coming, which they won't go as far as saying that, but they will tell you that, well, you know, it's again, two phases, but we have not seen one verse to elude two phases in his coming. It, it has not happened. That is something they are, that they, in their mind, it has to be because we know it's pre-trip. So therefore these things have to be, but no, let's go ahead and check. So second, uh, Daniel chapter two and verse 44, it says, and in the days of these Kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom that shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, and the great God have made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the uh, interpretation thereof is uh, interpretation thereof. Sure. So, okay, here's the thing about that. Now, without a doubt, that passage there in Daniel is a difficult passage, but notice it says in the days of these Kings, well, guess what? He has a chart in here showing the Nebuchadnezzar statue. And when it's talking about in the days of these Kings, you know, it's, we're like, it's in the days of the fourth kingdom. And it shows that he's going to come in the days of his fourth kingdom. That's when Christ came and set up his kingdom. Obviously it's a spiritual kingdom. Now I do believe in a literal physical one that's going to come to, but his kingdom is now, and it has spread out in all the world. And so, you know, that that's a tough passenger, but that doesn't prove anything one way or the other. Okay. And we don't see any good language in here, uh, to help us. Um, but, um, I don't think that passage really helps them with anything. We've got Daniel seven. Let's go ahead and look at Daniel seven and verse nine. And it says, and I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head, like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were open and I beheld. Then the voice of the great words of the horn spake. I beheld till even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed, even to the burning flame as concerning the rest of the beast. They had their dominion taken away. Their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom and that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and the kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. Now, here's the thing about that. So we've got Jesus. We would all agree. It's Jesus seated on a throne. Well, isn't the Bible pretty clear? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the father right now. Uh, isn't it pretty clear in the scriptures too, at the great commission, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It looks like, G it looks like this already happened. It looks like this stuff that Dan was speaking of already took place. We have scriptures in the, in the new Testament showing us where this has happened and it, and it is. And so again, I do still believe that there is going to be a day when a physical manifestation that's going to take place. But it was in the days of the fourth King in the days of the Roman empire, when Jesus came and set up his earthly kingdom. So 
these things aren't really helping them and that's deep stuff we're not going to um you know those are those are areas where i don't get real mad at people for being a little confused or even having a different opinion now here's an interesting one so we've already established that the rapture happens at the resurrection right at the coming of the lord at the appearing so in daniel chapter 12 they have daniel chapter 12 and in verse 1 it says and at that time shall michael that's interesting see the lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel okay just a coincidence the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Well, well that's interesting. We've got a resurrection taking place. And these people who are resurrecting just happen to be shining like the brightness of a firmament. That's interesting. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, his face shone like the brightness of the sun. When he was transfigured, when he's with Moses and Elijah, like he had taken on his glorified form. I thought we were going to be like that when we see Christ. Doesn't that kind of sound like us? You say, but oh, wait a minute. Uh, you say, but no, that is about... You know, that's about the resurrection for the Jews. They are the ones that are written in the book. Okay. And that's what people tell you. What the pre troopers will have to tell you, that's about the Jews. Okay. Let me prove to you that's not about the Jews. It's about God's people. Okay. Those of faith. And, and not only is it about God's people, those of faith, but it's specifically not about the Jews. Look at, and I'm, we're not going to go through this whole passage, but I, uh, Psalms 69, uh, let's start, let's start in verse 21. They gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Oh, that's quoted in the new Testament. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. That's in the new Testament. Pour out thine indignation upon them. And let thy wrathful anger take hold on them. Sounds like these people are appointed to wrath. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute you, him whom thou hast smitten. They talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity. Let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. There are multiple passages in, in verses in that passage that are quoted in the New Testament and applied to the Jews. And what did it say in there? Blot them out of the book of the living. Let them not be written with the righteous. And then what, but what do dispensationalists do? They go to Daniel 12, those written in the book. That's the Jews. Baloney. Baloney. No, God's wrath is on them. So they are appointed to wrath. So, and this teaching that there's the rapture is going to come and then God's going to go back to this dealing with the Jews. And then there's going to be like another rapture for the Jews later. No, that is a hundred percent contrary to what the scriptures teach. So you cannot make that about the Jews. So, you know, the, the Jews were God's people back then. Again, God's the, the Jews disobeyed. They did not do what they were supposed to do. These promises will be fulfilled through Christ and through those who are in Christ. And that includes Jews like Paul and the early apostle and the apostles and the early Christians and Gentiles. So this is not going well. This is not going well at all for you people. So the next passage they have Zechariah 12, 10, let's go ahead and go to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. And here we go. Get it on the screen for you. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in the bitterness for his firstborn. So they're saying that happens at the second coming. Um, I'm sorry, but my King James Bible says that that happened at his first coming. 
say, what, what are you saying? Um, John 19, 37. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And that it showed that right after, guess what? They pierced him. Now, let me just take some time. So, but I don't see all these wonderful things happening. Um, how is he not pouring out grace? Okay. We're saved by grace through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is, that is him, his blood being shed. That is him pouring out grace. And he literally is supplicating. He's praying, making supplication for Israel, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How is that not him pouring out grace and supplication? You see, dispensationalists have like this Calvinistic mindset when it comes to the Jews, like God's going to force them all to get saved. That's how they read these passages. No, they still have a choice. But Jesus came and did everything he said he was going to do. And many Jews did accept it. And they, re they are recipients of these things. But as a whole, the nation rejected them. Guess what? They weren't supposed to do that. But they did. So sorry, that already happened. You say, well, what about in Revelation? They'll look at me whom they pierced. Um, you know what? Fine. You want to bring that up? Let's go ahead. Let's look at that. Revelation 1, 7. Let's see if we notice any differences here. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. Where, now, I'm looking for the grace and supplication here. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Okay. All the kindreds of the earth are going to wail except the Jews. No, they're going to be wailing too. They're specifically singled out. They're the ones who pierced him. And he's not pouring out grace and supplication during that time. At his second coming, he's going to be pouring out his wrath. We saw that in Psalm 68. Psalm 68. It showed, let them not be written with the righteous. God's wrath is on them. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, we all love reading the verses about how we have not been appointed unto wrath. But you know who was appointed to wrath in 1 Thessalonians? Let's go look at this. Hey, folks, this is, this is big stuff right here. I think it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Watch this. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea. Are in Christ Jesus, for ye have also also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, nor contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Folks, God's wrath is on the Jews. There is not this special salvation coming from there is a special judgment coming from the special salvation already came on Israel at the crucifixion of Christ. And he's pouring out his blood and he's making supplication for them. Unfortunately, there were not as a whole, they did not all receive it, but somehow people are reading these passages and acting like it's got to be forced on all of them. That's absolutely ridiculous. What a massive butchering of the scripture that is. And all, so these passages they're taking, they're putting them all into the future. When I'm showing you these things already happened in the past. Now let's go to Zechariah 14, Zechariah chapter 14. This episode might go a little long. Ah, man, it's 15 verses. I'm not going to read all of this one, but this is about the, uh, him stepping foot on the Mount of Olives. Okay. I will agree with them. I do place that later after the rapture i would put that the stepping foot in the mount of olives i think that happens you know when he kicks off the millennium so i'll agree with him on that and if you want to call that uh i, I i'm not going to call that the second coming passages the second coming is, is the coming of our lord is the term that's been used and um i th but at the same time i do think that's probably a separate event um so let's go to Matthew 13. Okay, I'm probably not going to go through all of these just because I didn't want this to be a super long episode, but I do want to get to the, at least these next two. All right, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 41. And it says, 
the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and they which do iniquity. Okay, so they think that's going to happen at the end. Now, I'd be interested in seeing the proof of that. I think that's going to happen at the rapture. Okay, and so um, again, it, it would be hard to prove one way or the other. At the same time, well, if you go back, you have the parable um, sowing the good seed. So yeah, let, let's read this parable. Okay, let's read this parable and see if there's any reason to think this is a separate event. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked ones. These sounds like fake Christians that are out there. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The son of man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and they which do iniquity. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be we uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I don't see why that is different than what we've been talking about. Paul's already used the term the gathering that's going to take place. We've also I think they just need that to be a separate event. But there's nothing in the words of those passages that tell us that that is a different event. Okay? And so uh, let's go to now the big one. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And based on the language that has been used so far, okay, let's see if we are wrong in thinking that this is the same event. Okay, so hopefully you've all been following and paying very close attention to the language. So, they have uh, on, on this chart, Matthew 24, 15 through 31. So they believe this is second coming and it is not the rapture. So let's look at this. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by a need of the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time known or ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Whoa, 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 whoa. That sounds like a physical salvation. Didn't they have a verse in their rapture passages about a physical salvation? Yes, they did. They had a verse of Paul talking about a physical salvation. And here it looks like we're talking about a physical salvation. During this time of great tribulation, it's so bad that if except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, the days shall be shortened. It sounds like we're going to receive salvation at the coming of the Lord. Okay, we all agree we're all saved right now, but this is physical salvation. So we have a New Testament verse that we all agree is about the rapture and it, it's talking about a physical salvation. Why is that? Why is this different? There's no reason to think that this is different. Without a doubt, this is the same thing. We got a physical salvation. This sounds like what Paul talked about. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall rise false Christ and false prophets. They shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Where if they, for if they say unto you, behold, he is in the desert going out forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. If you say he's in the North Pole, don't believe that either. Okay, those of you who saw my live stream yesterday know what I'm talking about. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so this event, they called it the coming of the Son of Man. Well, that's not the same as the coming of the Lord. It's the same event. It's referring to it as his coming. The coming of the Lord. Look, it's two phases. Where are we seeing two phases? We have no passages indicating, alluding to 
two phases. It absolutely is not there. You do not get that language from the Bible. You get it from your textbooks. Now, here, here's why they have to do this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned to dark, uh, shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Boy, that sounds kind of like the sixth seal. That sounds kind of like the sixth seal. Um, Oh, wait a minute. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon and blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And again, am I out to lunch and saying the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord Jesus Christ is the same event? I don't think I am. I think, I think this fits. I think that, I think we're seeing exactly what Paul described, except he's talking in greater detail about the tribulation of that time. And so, and then shall appear. And then shall appear. Boy, uh, surely that can't be the appearing. Surely that can't be the appearing Paul talked about, the appearing that James talked about. I think James did, uh, that uh, Peter talked about. Surely that can't be the same. Uh, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Sounds like Revelation 1 7, which they have as a second coming passage. Um, and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When we see him, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. See, people get confused. They read that passage. Well, that doesn't sound like the thief in the night because the thief in the night movie is baloney. It was cheap, lame stuff. It was a way they could have the coming of Christ in a way where they wouldn't have to use special effects because it was such a low budget movie. So, but that's not what it's going to look like. And that is, is going to look like this. And so uh, he's going to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. It's going to get, I beseech you by the coming of our Lord and by our gathering together on him. It, boy, am I out to lunch in thinking these are the same events? Paul's using all the same words. And not only do we see a consistency in the words that are being used, but we are seeing a consistency in words that these people insist on using to describe these events, words that we cannot find in our King James Bible. So I don't know. I think someone's being dishonest with the scriptures. I think somebody's twisting and, manip and manipulating the scriptures to promote an agenda of their thief in the night style rapture. And when I say thief of the night, I'm not referring to the biblical reference to thief in the night. I'm talking about the movie, a thief in the night folks, without a doubt, this is the same event. And this is why pre-tribbers will always refrain from using biblical language. Biblical language will reveal their errors, their inconsistencies, and it will point you straight to uh, the post-trib, pre-wrath position, and they can't have that. And we're not going to go through the rest of these, but I, I do want to hit a couple highlights because interestingly enough, um, on the rapture passages, they had 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Philippians, or 1 Thessalonians 2.19, 4.13-18, through 18, and 5.9-23. They had passages from chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, four and five in their second coming passages. This is awesome. Guess what verse they have in their second coming passages. I love this. This is, this is and it, let, let me show you just so you know, I'm not making it up. Look at that right there, right under acts three, 19 through 21. They have first Thessalonians three 13. I wonder what that says. Let's look it up. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Do you see that? With all his saints. And that creates a problem too, because look what they have here and the differences between the rapture and the glorious appearing. Christ comes in the air for his own. Christ comes with his own. No. We already showed you in chapter four, Christ is coming with them. He's coming with them. Them that sleep in Jesus, will God bring with them, with him? So first Thessalonians three is also about the rapture. And guess what? He's coming with his saints. He's coming 
with his Saints. What what inconsistency. This is absolutely insane. And but yet this is taught in every pre-trib church and they reveal themselves with their language. When you're when they're using when when they're using language in the words that they use, it shows that their their theology has been formed from textbooks and not the words of God. They they say contradictory things. They'll say things like Christ comes not at the rapture is coming for his saints. The second coming is coming with his saints. That those that is contrary to the words Paul used to describe events that even they would agree is about the rapture. So folks watch people's language. Listen to how they speak. Listen to the words that they use. It will reveal who they are disciples of. And you can tell the difference between those who are a student of the word and who use the words of God and those who are using the words of man, the words of textbooks. The language in the Bible is very clear. If we formed our theology from the language of the scriptures, it would lead you towards a what people we would call a post-trib pre-wrath position. That is what it would lead you to. And... I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, this is absolutely nuts. And pre-tribbers, I dare you to describe, use scripture to describe the coming of our Lord. All these events that you would say is rapture, but only use biblical terms, use the words of God. You can't do it. You absolutely can't do it. Here And here's all that they've got. And this, and this is nothing. And we could turn this around and do it back to them and i would except for the fact that it makes us look foolish but what they'll do is they will find an additional detail that's in a different passage and then they will pit those passages against each other well i don't see a resurrection meant in matt 24 that means it's a different event uh it doesn't conflict with the idea of a resurrection the problem is jesus is not describing the resurrection at that time he's re describing his coming when we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is focused on the resurrection because he's focusing on what, uh, you know, what's going to happen with those who they had lost. He's comforting them, not with the fact they won't go through tribulation, but that they will see their lost loved ones again. And Paul makes it very clear that that is going to happen at the coming of the Lord. So whenever we read it, so when, and so Paul referring to this event that has been known as the resurrection as the coming of the Lord tells us, tells those who are looking for the coming of the Lord to expect it or those who are looking for the resurrection to expect it at the coming of the Lord. So when I'm reading about Matthew 24 and it's describing the coming of the Lord and the tribulations can be going on in those days and how Christ is going to come and gather us up. It's not, it's okay for me to say, Oh, this is when the resurrection is because this is the coming of the Lord that Paul referred to. Paul used the same language that Jesus did. And if I can just go ahead and do one more passage, all right, one more passage. They have this in their second coming passages. And that is of course, second Thessalonians two, which they said, they said, verse one is about the rapture. And I definitely agree with them on that. But uh, what they have on their chart is just verse eight. Um, and so in verse eight it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming of now, now, now folks just go read all of these scriptures okay, that they put, go read all these scriptures and look at how many times they were referred to as the coming of the Lord many times, but then all of a sudden, when they get to second Thessalonians, and even though they have, okay, it, we'll, we'll go back to their list. They have the coming of the Lord, the rapture in first Thessalonians one, first Thessalonians two, first Thessalonians four, first Thessalonians five, second Thessalonians two. But then when you get down here to first Thessalonians three, which clearly lines up with what we see in first Thessalonians four. They want to say it's the second coming all of a sudden, but that's Christ coming with his saints in first Thessalonians three. It's referred to as the coming of the Lord. 
And yet, all of a sudden, though, when we get to 2 Thessalonians 2, we're supposed to think that this is not the same event as the coming of the Lord that he was talking about in first uh, in, in the whole book of 1 Thessalonians. And it, and it says, too, in verse 1, we beseech you by the coming of our Lord. They said, they said that that is the rapture. And then here, all of a sudden, his coming is not, that's a different event. What in the text would make you think that we have switched events from verse one to verse eight? There's only one reason you would think that. And that is if you went into this passage with a predetermined idea that the rapture and the second coming are two different events and that the coming is after the tribulation, after the abomination desolation or, or, or that the rapture is before the abomination desolation, the antichrist, all that stuff. You are forcing that into the text. So they have the coming of Paul used the term coming of the Lord in verse one and in verse eight. And they say they're two different events. That is wacky. That is absolutely ridiculous. And so we could go on and on and just, they've, they've got a lot more passages too. They, they have a lot more passages too. And basically what it all comes down to revelation 19. Okay. Revelation 19 is, is a passage that I think we've all probably gotten wrong. Um, in a lot of ways, I'm not hundred percent convinced that that is not in reference to the rapture. And I know that'll blow a lot of people's minds, but there's, there's reasons that it, it can be because there's a lot of symbolic stuff in revelation. First off in chapter 14, you have an angel gathering a group and casting them into the wine press of the wrath of God. You have another angel gathering a group to be with the Lord. Okay. We would say that's a rapture. It could be in revelation 19. We're not so much looking at like this literal local event that takes place, you know, at the Valley of Jehoshaphat outside of Jerusalem, but this could just be a, you know, a general overview of the coming of our Lord where he's coming with his saints and he is going to gather us up too. But then he's also going to begin pouring his wrath out in the world. We don't see him stepping on Mount of Olives in Revelation 19. It does not show that. Everyone will tell you that's when he steps in the Mount of Olives, but it does not show him stepping foot on Mount of Olives there. We've just all done that in our charts, in our timelines. We could be wrong about that. But because that does, you know, we've successfully gotten an image in our mind of what that looks like, people try tying other clear rapture passages that are clearly also after the tribulation they've tried to make it that event and i think that um one they're wrong for sure you know but at, at the same time we could all be wrong about revelation 19 in the in the pre and the post-trib world but e either way even if post-tribbers and pre-tribbers are right that that is a separate event without a doubt all these other passages i've read are the same event they are all the same event. Now, I'll close with this. One passage they have, too, in here as a second coming passage. Let me, let me put it up on the screen. I'm, I'm going to end it with this. It says, and I'm going to ask you a question after we read this. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh. The Lord cometh. Is that the coming of the Lord when the Lord cometh? Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Uh, first Thessalonians three, the coming of our Lord with all his saints, even them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which uh, they have ungodly committed of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now here's, here's a question. I'm asking both sides. This I'm asking pre-tribbers and post-tribbers alike who all agree that revelation 19 is a different event somebody explain to me if that's first Thessalonians, prove to me if that's first thessalonians 4 or if it's revelation 19 i need somebody to explain to me why this event in first and first thessalonians 4 where jesus christ is coming with his saints is not the event of revelation 19 where christ is coming with his saints if those are two different events Somebody explain to me which one Jude is talking about. Is that Revelation 19 or is it 1 Thessalonians 4? It fits the description of both. 
It fits the description of both. So, uh, give me your best reasons in the comments for why those are two different events. And then after you do that, I want you to tell me which one Jude belongs with. Is that 1 Thessalonians 4 or is it Revelation 19? Which one? Not a lot of facts in there. Not a lot of details given in there. It refers it to says, as the coming of the Lord. It says the Lord cometh. You're going to tell me that's not the coming of the Lord? That's what Paul called 1 Thessalonians 4, the coming of our Lord. So y'all got to deal with that. I'm not saying I got all the answers on that. I don't know. I'm thinking they might all be the same event. They, they might. I don't know. If, if, they, if those are two different events, I don't know which one to put Jude. I don't know which one it goes to. So somebody tell me, post trippers, you tell me, where does Jude belong? Revelation 19 or 1 Thessalonians 4 or both? You know what? I Maybe I, no, wait, no, I can only do that. And I, I, Yeah, so what I might do, I might put a poll on my channel. You tell me what you think. Jude, the prophecy in Jude 1, uh, 14 and 15, is that, does that go with 1 Thessalonians 4? or with Revelation 19, or both. There's three options. You tell me which one you think. Leave in the comments your best reasons for why you think what you think. So either way, isn't it interesting when we use the language of the scriptures? It actually brings a lot of clarity to things. And it, you, know what it, you know what it does? It messes with our textbooks. Boy, does it mess with our textbooks. So this is where we find out who we are true followers of the Bible or a camp or a textbook. So I appreciate everyone watching this. I hope it was a blessing and I hope you pain eaters, your heads exploded because I dared to challenge you. And Hey, if we're right, I kind of think those are two different events. If we're right, we ought to be able to handle a challenge. Okay. Let, let, let's fix this. Let, let's prove it. Let, let, let's prove this. I, I would like to have, I want the proof. Somebody help me, help me get, help me get the proof on this. All right. You pain eaters that know it all. This is your chance. This is your chance to shine. Show me why that that is a different event and I will, I will, I will appreciate it. I will greatly appreciate it. And so uh, sharing me a, a clip of somebody saying it is a different event is not proof. Show me from the scriptures. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this. I hope it was a blessing. God bless. You.